Hi, this is Johns Hopkins, and we're back again with another Baltimore Heritage 5-Minute History videos. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Today, I think we're going to go uh, jump across the harbor and go over to the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Um, and before I get going uh, with that, we're going we're gonna to talk about canneries uh, and canning. But before I talk about that, I thought I'd just give a little bit of a plug for the BMI. Um, on their website, they've got a great resource uh, for kids and activities that kids can do at home. And so we'll put the link for that at the end of this video, and hopefully that'll help, uh, help all of us parents out there stay a little bit uh, better engaged. All right, over uh, across the basin, which is what it would have been called back when we're uh, in the period we're going to talk about, 1865, the BMI is actually inside an old cannery, uh, the Platt and Company Oyster Canning uh, uh, Factory. Um, the building that they have is the, the warehouse building, and it was part of a complex that was up and running in the 1860s. And if you uh, think about that, and when I learned about it, I was surprised. I thought, uh, canning in the Civil War? Uh, and the answer is absolutely. Uh, canning got started in New England in the 1830s. Um, and if, if uh, by the 1840s, uh, Baltimore's canning operations were sending oysters, canned oysters, out to the 49ers, um, not, the, uh, not the football team, but the, uh, the 49ers, the 1849ers, out prospecting for gold. And during the Civil War, if you were a, a soldier who had a can of oysters in your rations, uh, you felt yourself pretty lucky. And those oysters definitely would have come from Baltimore and the Chesapeake Bay, um, would have come from the Chesapeake Bay and would have been canned in Baltimore. So in this complex, uh, uh, there's the warehouse that's now part of the, the Baltimore Museum of Industry um, exhibit space. Uh, there was also what was uh, something called the shucking shed, and this is where the oyster shuckers uh, would stand uh, and perform their work. Um, they would, the, the sheds were usually unenclosed, they were just basically a roof, um, and the shuckers would stand in stalls and with their shucking knives and uh, take apart the oyster, drop the oyster into a pail, and just leave the, the shells on the ground to be swept up at the end of their shifts. Uh, the shuckers got paid per pail. There was no minimum wage back then. Um, and it was pretty uh, terrible work. Uh, you were more or less outside, and, uh, and oyster canning went on in the winter months. So it was cold, it was wet, um, you were standing in all the oyster mess, um, and it was low wage. It's not surprising that most of the shuckers were African-American uh, men and women and uh, newly arrived immigrants. And in fact, uh, the Baltimore Museum of Industry, the Platt and Company um, oyster packing uh, canning place is in Locust Point, which is right where uh, the port of, point of entry for European immigrants would have been um, in the years following the Civil War. So a natural place for somebody coming off a ship uh, who was poor and in, and in need of a job. The other thing that was on that site were railroad tracks, um, and that allowed railroad cars to pull directly up next to the cannery and, uh, and get loaded as the cans were rolling off the, uh, the processing line, so to speak. Um, uh, the, uh, just one more word about the, uh, the shuckers themselves. Uh, kind of in keeping with the morals of the day, there were, they were segregated by men and women. Um, and then the other population that got pulled in were kids. Uh, there were no child labor laws back then. I think the first federal labor law, uh, real one that had any teeth, was 1908. So back in 1865 with Platt and company, um, uh, children were very much fair game. Um, I want to wrap it up with two things. One is uh, the Platt & Company uh, cannery was one of over 70 on the, on the basin, uh, along the basin, the Inner Harbor today. Um, just think of that, 70 canneries all operating uh, all along the, harbor, the shores of the harbor. The canning industry back then uh, employed 15,000 people, so a significant, uh, a significant um, job creator. With, uh, with all that industry going on, there was a fair amount of innovation as well. And I'm going to mention two innovators whose names I think you may recognize. Uh, the first was a gentleman named Shriver. And Shriver invented uh, the pressure canning uh, technique that allowed, uh, allowed uh, industries like Platt and Company uh, to do not just one or two cans at a time, but to do up to 500 cans of oysters at a time. So just imagine that, uh, uh, going from two or three or four to 500 um, really allowed people to ramp up their operations. 
Um, and we know the Shriver family today, uh, Sergeant Shriver of Peace Corps fame, uh, many people may know, and Pam Shriver of tennis fame. Their great, great, great somebody or other, grandfather, uncle, um, was the Shriver who was the uh, canning inventor. The other invention was the addition of calcium chloride to the canning bath. And what that allowed, uh, uh, what, what that allowed was that um, you could raise the temperature of the canning solution um, and to can, I think you need to get up to not just boiling, but to uh, 240 or so degrees. And adding calcium chloride allowed people to be able to do that. Um, what used to take five or six hours could be done in an hour. So now we've got these 500 can operations that we're able to crank up and sterilize uh, within an hour. So really ramping up um, operations considerably. With those two inventions, uh, and then the invention of the oyster dredge that uh, significantly uh, ramped up the ability to collect oysters, um, the bay very quickly uh, got uh, totally depopulated of oysters, um, a, problem, a problem that we have today. Um, and a result of that was the, the closing of eventually all of the canning operations uh, on, in, in Baltimore. So the calcium chloride inventor was a gentleman named Isaac Solomon, and he, he eventually took his canning operation from Baltimore to a small island in Southern Maryland. And some of you may know uh, the island today we call Solomon's Island. Well, that's the connection, Isaac Solomon and his canning invention, that's, uh, that's the connection there. Final, final thing I want to uh, say is that the can, oyster canning operations took place in the winter months. Uh, during the spring and summer, the little oyster spat would grow and then they'd be harvested in September, beginning in September, um, and that's when they'd get canned. The canning operations then had to figure out what to do uh, in the rest, during the rest of the year. And, uh, and they've pretty quickly figured out that they could can vegetables. And Baltimore was an ideal place for canning vegetable because, vegetables because the Eastern Shore was a pretty quick uh, boat ride over. And so, you, so the operations in the summer would be getting tomatoes and beans and corn uh, into the canning facilities um, and, uh, and doing that during the uh, spring and summer months. The idea that you can only eat oysters in our months, I think I, I grew up with that. I think a lot of us uh, grew up with that. You only eat oysters in our months. Um, uh, where did that come from? Well, it stems back from this era of canning when the canning companies would can during the R months, September, October, November, December, uh, and, uh, and then can vegetables during the uh, spring and summer months. So I don't know if it was clever marketing or if it just sort of uh, became habit, uh, but eating oysters in the R months is not a safety concern at all. It was uh, stems back to uh, the, the yearly cycle of canneries. With that, I'm gonna say thanks for tuning in and we're gonna put up the website for the Baltimore Museum of Industries at home activity page uh, right after this. All right, we'll see you next time.